Welcome to session seven, a day to remember. This is kind of a part two from last night where we saw God's law vindicated in this great controversy where the lawless one would think to change the very times and laws. Tonight, we're going to expand on that very theme, particularly as it relates to the fourth commandment. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose a big question for you. You've probably noticed as you look around Christendom presently and throughout history that only about 1% of Christians in the world today recognize the validity of the fourth commandment, the seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment. Now do a little math with me. There are about 20 million people who observe the seventh day Sabbath as Christians, and there are about 2 billion, billion with a B, Christians in the world of some type or another. What percent would that be? Did I get it right? 1%, 20 million out of 2 billion. That's not a lot, is it? It kind of begs the question, how did 99% of Christianity miss the mark on such a vital point so clearly written in stone in the fourth commandment? Well, I want to share a couple of um, experiments, behavioral like science experiments right out of the gates here that will help you understand the human mind socially and as it reacts to authority. But I want to always, as we begin, have prayer that we would seek the Lord's wisdom and not man's. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the truth as it is in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your word and how clear it is and also how beautiful it is and how beautiful your character of love is that we may understand the law of love more deeply tonight, and your will, and not man's. And we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. amen. They had groups of eight people coming in, a row of eight chairs. That row happens to be exactly eight chairs. Isn't that quite fitting? And person number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven are in on the trick. This is a behavioral science experiment where person number eight comes in and a new person number eight sits in the chair with each session, but the seven actors are there to act their part. And what is their part? The experimenter holds pairs of cards like this in front of the group. And it's meant to be as easy of a question as possible so it eliminates any potential error from the discussion. What line does the card on the left match with on the card on the right, line A, B, or C? And the easy and obvious answer, of course, is C. But the seven people who've been schooled on the trick answer some of these pairs correctly. He goes through a number of them like that. Maybe the next one, it matches A, and, then the, and so on. And at a certain point, the seven are, are, are prepared to answer incorrectly, everybody answering the same incorrect answer. So he'd say, and they'd go right down the line. What, what is the answer? And person number one, if it was this pair, would go A. Person number two would say A. Person number three, A, four, five, six, and seven. Now poor person number eight is sitting there going, now these seven people all said A, and clearly this is C. What, he's thinking this in his head. What do you do in this social dilemma? Well, you might say it's not a dilemma. It's obviously C. I'd tell them, you know, sorry guys, I think you might have gotten that one wrong. That, I, I'm pretty sure that's C, isn't it? You would think that most people would do that. You would think you would do that. What Solomon Ash found in his experiment is that the majority of person number eights tested would answer wrong with the group at least some of the time. That surprised me when I heard that. You just answer wrong because everybody around you answered wrong? Well, why? He interviewed them. Why? Yeah, you don't want to make waves. You don't want to make people feel whatever. You want to fit in. But then he also found that a number of the people that he interviewed, he said, now why did you, did, did, were you aware that you answered some of the questions incorrectly? And that many of them said, no, what do you mean? Their eyes were literally playing tricks on them. The people in the group swayed their thinking in a way that they no longer had their proper reasoning faculties in place. Well, that's one. Here's another one. I told you I'd share a couple of experiments with you. You've probably heard of the Milgram experiment, Stanley Milgram from over 50 years ago also. And what he did was he had this setup where you had this, 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 this uh, pretend student on the other side of a wall. 
And the person being experimented on is told that you are a teacher of an innovative method of getting our students to be incentivized to answer questions correctly. And they will be taking a series of questions and your job is, if they get an answer incorrect, you must apply an electric shock. Like, really, I'm going to be shocking people? All right, and this is safe? Or, yes, this is an important experiment, and it is imperative that you apply the shocks as instructed. So you have this man in a white lab coat with this air of authority. He answered a question incorrectly. Please apply electric shock level one. Bzz, and then you'd hear persons on the other side of the wall, like, ah, like this. And then, okay, he got that one right. Oh, he got another one wrong. Increase the voltage and apply shock, please. And he would apply the shock. Now, as the voltage is increasing, they're seeing how many people drop off and still continue to obey these orders to hurt people on the other side of the wall. Well, <laughs> some of them start protesting like, are you sure? I mean, they have tape recordings on the, of people screaming, ah! in agony. They have people on the other side of the wall banging on the wall, begging to be released. I'm not sure. He's clearly uncomfortable. He clearly doesn't want to continue. It is imperative that the experiment continue. Please apply the shock. All he would do is repeat that line. Insisting, affirming that his authority is all that is needed here. 65% of these guinea pigs would take it all the way to 450 volts, a potentially lethal level of shock. And there was a red line at that point on the knob. 65% of people. He wanted to understand how otherwise decent people could become so captured by Nazi German tyranny that you have Gestapo and you have otherwise decent citizens of a German society, of what you would think was a presumably Christian society even, carrying people off to the death camps, putting them in the gas chambers. How could humanity be degraded to that level? Well, they were obeying authority. And that excuse was not allowed in the Nuremberg trials, was it? I just was obeying orders. Nazi Germany is a pretty intense and pronounced example of the darkness of the human capacity to give over its reason and its conscience. But in so many ways, in everyday life, in societal trends, and in authoritative proclamations, you have one of the two, either because the experts said so, or because that's what everybody's doing, right? It could be false human authority, or it could be conformity to the group. That will do one of two things, or maybe both. They can negate reason, and they can negate conscience. What do I mean by that? Which of these two took away people's conscience? The Milgram experiment or the Solomon Ash experiment? Which one was more focused on the human conscience? Milgram. How about reason? Solomon Ash. Now, what would be interesting would be to swap these. I don't know of any experimentation that's been done on this level, but I, I suspect, I would theorize, I would hypothesize that you could equally have authority negate reason and conformity negate conscience. I can't say for sure, but I can tell you this. This is legitimate authority that gives us and informs our conscience in a scriptural, godly manner. And it brings us to the question of the Sabbath Sunday controversy. Where did Sunday sacredness come from? It must be somewhere, I thought, when I first encountered one of these Bible prophecy preachers saying the Seventh-day Sabbath of the Bible was never overturned in all the scriptural study we saw last night, and I picked up the pamphlets, I studied these things. I wanted to know, how did the change happen? Where, when, how, whom? I said, it's got to be in there somewhere. And I even heard about a USA Today ad that was taken out by some people who believed in the Seventh-day Sabbath. And they said, we have a $10,000 reward to anybody who can show from the Bible that the Sabbath for Christians 
is Sunday, not Saturday. <laughs> and I was like, $10,000, they wouldn't say that if it's in there. So is it in there? It's got to be in there. No, it's not, it can't be. I never won the 10000 I asked people in my church community, hey, where did we get the idea of the sacredness of the first day of the week from? And what was the answer I probably got? You've probably heard it. Jesus was raised from the dead on the first day of the week. I know he was, and he was crucified on Friday, on the sixth day of the week. That's also a very important event, the cross of Christ, the crucifixion. And we don't recognize Friday as the new Sabbath for Christians. Does it say specifically in the Bible that Sunday is to be recognized as the Sabbath? And then people would scratch their heads and they're like, you know, I don't know of a text. And so that, per, that, that spurred on more study and conversations. When I'm 20 years old learning these things, I go to a college history major. I was a history major. I was a classmate of mine. And I said to him, hey, man, I'm learning in my Bible that, that the seventh day is the Sabbath and Sunday must have come in later and I'm trying to figure out when and where and why and, and who made the change and all that. But you know what? He, was, he stopped me in my tracks. And he goes, nah, I, I know that that's wrong. And I'm like, how do you know? And you know what his answer was? He said, because 99% of Christianity is observing Sunday and there's no way the whole of Christendom could have gotten this thing wrong. Conformity, right? <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute, that's not a biblical scriptural basis because everybody's doing it. I'll tell you how it happened in a nutshell. We can look at some of the history, but it's that dragon called the serpent, called the devil, called Satan, who does what? Deceives how much of the world? It's as if the whole world wonders after the beast in Revelation 13. It's as if the whole world. So I would be surprised if 99% of Christianity was right about this matter, given how significant God's law is in prophecy. Do you remember when we saw 2 Thessalonians 2, and it was about the, the man of sin or the lawless one? The first words off of the Apostle Paul's pen were, let no one deceive you by any means. It should not be a surprise that there is massive, overwhelming deception on the commandments of God because what does he proceed to say after this? He talks about how the Antichrist is against God's law. The lawless one, the lawless one. We've repeated that a few times. And we saw number nine of our ten identifiers of the little horn power that this Antichrist will think to change times and laws. Now, we didn't talk about that last night because we couldn't have a two-and-a-half-hour presentation, so we had to have part two tonight. And what I was jumping at the bit to share with you was this. The Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. When I read this, and I got a copy of it and read it in there, and I'm like, that is what it actually says? I couldn't believe this. Because if you're reading a Catholic catechism, you would know what the answer to that question is, right? It should say, it would, you'd expect them to say Sunday, right? Which day is the, the Sabbath day? A catechism is your beliefs. Did you know the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Saturday is the Sabbath? <laughs> you got to kind of just have a moment of, really? That's in, yes, that's in there. I mean, you can buy a copy yourself. I should have it. It's back at home. It begs the next question. Why do we Catholics observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Because the Catholic Church transferred the, solemn, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Those are boastful, pompous words, aren't they? You can't just go ahead and transfer the, the sacredness of the day that the Lord made sacred in Eden and say, we're going to just go ahead. Yeah, we, we realize that biblically, the seventh day is the Sabbath. But we observe Sunday because man's authority, church tradition, we transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. The amazing thing about this is it is admitting the Bible says Saturday, Saturday the seventh day. 
we say Sunday the first day, and that settles it, we're going with Sunday. Boy, that's, those are serious, boastful, pompous words. We've got to go, go obey God rather than man. And I want to restate the statement from two nights ago. That when we see this, this is not meant to throw stones at our fellow man and look at people who are, who are of the Roman Catholic faith and say, you're a bunch of pompous whatever. No, 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 no. That's not a Christian attitude whatsoever. This is about systems, not people. This is about that papal hierarchical church structure system. And most Catholic people are not even aware of this. And they come to these meetings and they're like, whoa, I'm going with the Bible, not with that guy. I like the Pope. I thought he was a good guy. Maybe not the present Pope. A lot of Catholics are like, I'm not sure about this one. But uh, when you see that the whole papacy for 1,260 years is the little horn power, no matter what religious background you have, you go, I'm going with Bible truth. This is eye-opening and life-changing stuff. Catholic Encyclopedia, the church after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath. Do you see an error in that? Yeah. The Jewish Sabbath. What did Jesus say? The Sabbath was made for the Jews. The Sabbath was made for man. Who was that man, the first man on earth when the Sabbath was made? Adam. He'd only been alive for one day at that point when God made the Sabbath. So God made the Sabbath for all mankind. They call it the Jewish Sabbath. But um, they say the church, after changing the day of rest, there it is again, from the Jewish Sabbath of the seventh day to the first day of the week, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. We made the commandment refer to a different day. I don't even like saying that out loud. It kind of makes your stomach feel icky even to hear that human beings would make that claim. But um, did you notice it was referred to as the third commandment? And you're like, wait a minute. No, it's the fourth commandment. Hit rewind in your brain to a few nights ago when we looked at the little horn power and we went to Vatican.va, the list of the Ten Commandments as laid out with the second commandment omitted, which moves the fourth commandment into third position in the pole position and then all the way down to ten, you get to the tenth commandment and it's the ninth, so they just give you a bonus. The rest of the tenth commandment is called number ten. Um, God is not trying to be tricky. I think that's an important thing to get his character right. He's not like, I'm going to sneak some things in there in the Bible that's going to make it really, really difficult for people to understand. And I'm going to trick, that's a devilish pi picture of God, that he would be trying to trick people out of getting into heaven. Those who come to the Bible, who stand alone on the Bible, who simply read it as it reads, fourth commandment, seventh day, will not be deceived. But if Satan can get us to step off of this solid ground of God's word on any point, then we are on dangerous territory, deadly territory. Jesus tells us how we cannot be deceived. Abide in my word. Then you know you're really his disciple. Then you will know the truth, and then you're set free, free from Fear that am I being deceived? No, no, no. I'm going with God's word, not with a, a system, not with man's authority, not with the crowd. And then there's no fear in that love. Do you know what the word disciple means, by the way? These would be Jesus' disciples were the Talmudim. They were those students of the teacher. And so are you a student of Jesus? Are you a student of the word? Not just in coming to meetings like this. This is great, but studying it on our own. I challenged my children with that because they've got a list of texts now from last night. And I said, I know you guys know this truth from the presentations, but do you know it for yourself in your own study? We can each do that. Sit at Jesus' feet day by day and say, what is next, Lord? Draw me closer to you. Draw me closer to your ideal for me. And I push ahead in Bible truth. I grow in grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul called it. And in John 6, Jesus gave this tough teaching that a lot of people didn't want to press on through because they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Have you ever had one of those moments? You ever had one of those moments where it's like, God, I don't know if I can do that. And you know what he says? That's a good place for you to start. Because if you think, I, can, I got this, you know, that's self-sufficiency. So we, he likes to hear that from us. God, I don't know if I can do that. 
you come to a point in your journey with God's Word and He puts a challenge on you and you say, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And you know what the answer to that question is? Who can accept it? What do you say is the answer to that? Can I? Christ in me, the hope of glory, can accept that. Not me in my own strength. They walked away from him, many of the disciples. And the twelve were surrounding their, their rabbi, their teacher, their Lord, their Savior. And he said to them, you aren't going to go too, are you? And what did they say to him? Where else would we go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. Isn't that beautiful, their faith? And yes, they faltered and they struggled, but they became the strong apostles of the Christian church. Lord, to whom shall we go, said Peter? You have the words of eternal life. And that's where millions and millions and millions of truth seekers have come to. When you come to this point and you're going, I don't know about the seven-day Sabbath thing, people are going to think I've gone crazy. Listen, Jesus said, you are my disciples indeed when you heed my teaching. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they make changes. And they, I, I, I started doing this. I went to my boss, and I'm like, boss, I can't come in on Saturdays. He's like, what? Really? That's the busiest day. You're one of my most important people. I said, well, I'll come in. I'll do whatever for you, whatever. You know, on, on Sundays, you name it. They're not open on Sundays, but I was able to do things for him on Sundays, and he made accommodations for me. And... You, those, and sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes it's, nah, you, you're going to just be fired then. Yeah. So I don't mean to tell my story to make it easy because uh, my boss was so kind. But here's a question. Did you wonder yesterday why Satan would place this commandment under his special care to deceive and divert? What is it about the fourth commandment? Is it just a day? Is it just about like, you know, well, we got the day, right? We got the day. If it's just a day, I think there's something more to this commandment. When I held those posters up earlier during Q&A, did you notice more ink, or I guess it's more space carved in stone, was dedicated to the fourth commandment than any other commandment? This is a teaching moment in the 10. God is giving some more substance there. Do you remember last night we saw the two reasons why the Sabbath was given, that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, that you may remember the Sabbath, for in six days God created. Can you think of a more important thing than God as creator and God as redeemer? There's nothing more important than God's character as revealed through his creation and his redemption through Jesus Christ. Those are the most important truths in the universe, and the Sabbath contains both. You think Satan likes the Sabbath? Do you think he wants us to think of God as our loving creator and Jesus as our redeemer? Matthew 22, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. I think I said Matthew 20 last night, didn't I? It was Matthew 22. I was asking for the reference on that. Now you've got it. First four commandments, last six, love God, love your neighbor. We covered that last night. But you know what we didn't mention? The fourth commandment is at the end of the first table, right? So you got, have no other gods, no idols, and then remember the name, or do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, and then remember the Sabbath. This one we consider as predominantly belonging to the first table because it's worship of God. That's the whole controversy in Revelation 13 and the controversy between Christ and Satan. Who will you worship? Who will you obey? And it does belong there. But there is actually an element of the fourth commandment that is a transition point to how we love our neighbor. Can you think of it? What in the fourth commandment actually talks about our relationship with our neighbor? You're getting it. Yeah, don't put other people to work. Other people. So this commandment is the hinge point between the first table and the second table. It contains both love God and love your neighbor because you're not requiring other people to work for you on a day that God has proclaimed as sacred. So it, it contains God as creator and redeemer, it contains both love God and love your neighbor. It's not just about a day. By the way, if it was just about a day, we would still obey it, wouldn't we? Because <laughs> God said it. I mean, he's God. He is the authority. So this can boil down to a simple test of authority, legitimate authority, man's versus God's. But there's more to it than that, which I find beautiful. 
Speaking of just a day, it's, if it was just a day, we shouldn't use that phrase because, honey, May 30, 2003, is that just a day to you? She, she's looking at me like, no way. That's our anniversary. It's not just a day. It's, it, there, there's, there, it's a memorial of something meaningful. And if I was to say, you know, honey, it's a busy month. I realize our anniversary is next week. Say it's May, you know, a few months from now. And I say to her a week ahead, I'm just kind of busy this year. I don't know if I'm going to have, have any time to, to do anything. And then May 30 rolls around, and I'm gone, and I come to bed late. And the next day, I'm like, hey, honey, what's for breakfast? And she's just like... And then in July, I'm go, I go, you know, July 17, I say, happy anniversary, honey. She's like, you forgot it. You know, it doesn't have the same meaning on July 17 because something happened on that day. What happened on the seventh day in creation? God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day, proclaimed it holy. And when God says something's holy, that's a whole lot more than an anniversary. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We saw last night, commandments and faith are not in opposition to one another. That's another devilish deception. If you pursue obedience without faith, then yeah, that's bondage, a curse, a ministry of death. I'm quoting from the Apostle Paul in Galatians and in 1 Corinthians. So let's not get any idea that we're earning salvation through obedience to the Ten Commandments. But notice those people of the last days that are called the saints, the believers, they have faith in Jesus Christ unto salvation. And as a response, naturally, we obey. But here's what the Jews of Paul's day and Jesus' day got wrong. The Pharisees, Israel pursued the law of righteousness, Paul says, but they did not attain to the law of righteousness. Why? It's a good question, isn't it? It's kind of asking the question, why did Judaism of the first century fail? Why did they not find the righteousness of Christ? Well, I just gave it away, didn't I? Paul answers it because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. They thought the works of the law were a means to salvation. And Paul had lived that life, and he was converted away from it, and that's why he called it bondage, a curse, and a ministry of death. But people misunderstand that, and they go, well, the Ten Commandments are bondage, curse, and ministry of death. False. Paul said they are holy, just, and good. He said, by no means would we sin or transgress the law because we are under grace, but we establish the law, we uphold the law. And we saw that last night. We won't, be, won't repeat it again. But now the text you've been waiting for, Hebrews 4, such an important text. There remains, therefore, a rest. And my friends, this text teaches the perpetuity and continuation of the Seventh-day Sabbath in the New Testament. And it is misconstrued to say, it's been done away with. What? It says it right there in the first five words of the verse that there remains, therefore, a rest. And do you know what the Greek word there is for rest? It's sabbatismos, which literally means a keeping of the Sabbath. A keeping of the Sabbath remains for the people of God. That's an important New Testament text, isn't it? I think that's on the poster where the New Testament Ten Commandments, or where the Ten Commandments are reiterated in the New Testament. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. Underline that in your Bibles. Remember that text. That is an important New Testament text. We saw last night that the Sabbath was never done away with in the New Testament, but it is also restated. Jesus kept God's commandments. He said, 40 years from now, you're going to be calling the seventh day the, the Sabbath. He was speaking to his followers, those who would be the Christians, four decades later. Paul continued to observe the Sabbath, even with the Gentiles we saw last night. And here's an explicit text saying that a keeping of the Sabbath, a sabbatismos, remains for the people of God. Now, reading on in the verse, you're going to see where people 
find something that can invert this verse and misconstrue it. It says, For he who has entered his, meaning God's rest, has himself also ceased from his works. Now pause there. I hope we have all ceased from works salvation and have entered into the rest of salvation through Jesus Christ, His merits, His blood, His righteousness. There is a rest in that, isn't there? Knowing you don't have to earn salvation through works, through sacraments, through legalistic observances of Pharisees. There is peace in that. There is rest in that. So you enter into that rest, but also there remains a Sabbath-keeping where we rest, what does the last five words say? As God did from His. As God did from His, what does that mean? As God rested from His work. A Sabbath keeping remains for the people of God where we rest, yes, in salvation, but also as God rested from His works. How did God rest from His works? How did, how did God rest from His work? When? Where? Yeah, in Eden, on the seventh day, God rested from his work. And there remains a Sabbath keeping for us where we rest as, as who? As God rested from his. Was that clear? Yes. That is so important because this text is thrown us and you don't keep the Sabbath because of Hebrews 4. I'm like, wait a minute. It says the opposite. It says we're going to rest as God rested, literally. On the seventh day of the week, it is a privilege, it is a joy to enter into that rest with him as he did. Uh, God didn't rest from work salvation in just some, you know, um, symbolic way. He, he never sinned. He didn't rest in that sense. He rested literally. And we can apply this both, both ways. We're, we are resting from our work salvation mindset, but we're also literally resting on the seventh day because that's what God did. And this says to rest like God did. Well, how about Sunday in the New Testament? You know this first day of the week is mentioned eight times in the New Testament. Turn to John chapter 20, please. You'll see we're going to look at three of these. We won't look at all eight. Um, three of them are where some detail is given about the first day of the week. And so if there is going to be a change from Sabbath to Sunday, it would, it would be found in these three texts. We'll look at them very quickly together. Um, you can look at the other five. It's just a mention of the first day of the week. But these are where some detail is given where if there was going to be a change instituted, you'd find it. John 12, 20, verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. The Jew Jesus had been crucified. He was raised from the dead. But the disciples are afraid and they're hiding. They're behind locked doors here. So does this verse say anything about transferring the holiness of the seventh day to the first day? It says nothing like that? Does it say the Sabbath was done away with? doesn't say anything like that. What kind of assembling are they doing here? It says they were assembled for fear of the Jews. Um, later in, uh, in, in, in the Roman church during the Dark Ages, they would, they would look back on this and do some revisionist history, and they would be like, this was the first Sunday Mass ever held. The Bible says they were assembled for fear of the Jews, not celebrating a Catholic Mass here, but there was no such thing at the time anyway. Here's a second text, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, and it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must also do, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Do you sometimes lay something aside, storing up in your personal life? You know what? These are crazy times. Maybe we should have, have some extra canned goods on hand. You know, you lay something aside. Maybe you're preparedness minded. Or, or how about just prudent financial stewardship? When I get my paycheck at the beginning of the month, or the beginning of the week in this case, I make plans for what I will do with those finances that I've been blessed with. And wouldn't it be faithful as a steward of these resources to, before I go and spend it all week, the first day of the week, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm doing my budgeting here. 
I'm laying something aside, storing it up. Each one of you. Are they in church passing the collection plates here? No, it's, you're storing it up, you're laying it aside yourself. So this is not even about an assembly of any kind. <clears throat> so this kind of prompts a provocative question you can ask yourself or a friend. You can say, can you think of any Bible texts that give us some instruction on how we as Christians should conduct ourselves on Sunday? I can think of two texts. Can you think of any texts that give instruction on what we should do on Sundays? This is one of them. You could, and it's, I don't mean dogmatically, like we have to do our you know, financial budgeting on Sunday, but there's some good advice. That's one. The second, six, six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. That's part of the commandment. Isn't that interesting? So the Bible tells us how to observe Sunday. Work and do your financial budgeting that day and set aside your, your uh, tithes and offerings. Okay, that's the second one. Here's the third one. Acts 20, verses 7 and 8. Um, before we read this one, it's probably important that we establish the, the Jewish day and how, the, how they considered the day throughout the whole Bible, not just Jewish, from Adam. In fact, have you read Genesis? Everybody here has probably read Genesis 1, right? You did a Bible reading plan, and you made it through Genesis, Genesis chapter 1, right? Maybe you never finished the Bible in a year. I, I think you can give it a try, give it another stab if you haven't, but everybody's made it through Genesis 1, right? And what do you hear in that? It's a refrain. It's a poetic refrain. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. There was evening and there was morning the third day, and so on, right? So the day is counted as from sundown, the day begins, and there is evening first. So the dark part of the day comes first, and then morning and the rest of the day. At sunset that next day, it transitions now to the subsequent day. So the, the biblical day was from sunset to sunset. And the important part for what we're going to look at in Acts here is the dark part of the day comes what? First or second? First, followed by the morning light of that same day and the day period. So the dark part comes first. Now, let's read Acts 20, verses 7 and 8, and we're going to see about a gathering that the apostles were having. You've already seen a number of texts in Acts that Paul had the habit of meeting with the believers on Sabbath. Well, in, in chapter 20, it states here that it was on the first day of the week that the disciples came together to break bread. Paul, ready to depart the next day or in the morning. And he spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Now that's enough detail right now. It's a really cool story because somebody dies and then is raised from, raised from the dead and falls out of the window. He's falling asleep. And this is always a, a pastor, a speaker's uh, favorite text to point out that I always have mercy on you by not take, keeping you till midnight. So um, <laughs> I appreciate your, 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 uh, your tolerance and patient endurance of the saints. But nonetheless, what time of day is this? Is, let me just ask it this way. Is it dark out or light out here? It's dark out. So this is the dark part of the first day of the week. So students, here's a question for you. What, what, it says he's going to be traveling in the morning. When was he planning to travel? What day of the week? Did you say Thursday? Oh, first day. I was like, wait, wait, wait. I got to start over if somebody thought it was Thursday. She said, first day. Okay, I think everybody got it right because I heard a number of Sundays and I heard a first day. I didn't hear anybody say Monday, which means you got it. He was going to depart Sunday morning. How do we know? Because this meeting was in the dark. It was in the evening of the first day of the week. We would call this meeting Saturday night. The Bible calls it the first day of the week. And you call it the first day of the week, too. Um, when we as a family recognize Sabbath as being from sundown to sundown, sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night, after sundown Saturday night, we, we start talking about, hey, it's the first day of the week now. And, and sometimes this time of year when there's a few hours of darkness and you know we'll, we'll, we'll do some chores or whatever, and uh, it, it, it is the first day of the week at that point. Now, go, go to, go to uh, Paul here. 
He's in the dark part of the first day of the week. So the first day of the week begins Saturday night when sun sets. They're doing this thing till midnight. He's going to get a few hours sleep and then travel in the morning. So his, what was Paul's travel day? Sunday, the first day of the week. He was with the brethren Saturday evening. Why? Because he always had that custom that Jesus had too of worshiping on the seventh day of the week. So this text actually underscores that what we looked at last night in Acts 16 and Acts 13, that Paul's ministry was especially religiously focused in worship. I mean, he ministered all the time, but the day of worship and of, of assembling, of a convocation was the seventh day of the week. Is that beautiful? I find that to be so supportive of God's, God's word once again. Um, I want to share with you just a little bit of history, though, because I, I, I started to get into this question of when the change took place and where and how and by whom. This was really important to me because I was a history nerd. And I just, I just had to have the answer to this. Now, you don't necessarily have to have that answer of tracking down exactly when it happened. Because now at this point of our study, from last night and tonight, it's ably, crystally clear in God's word about the perpetuity of the seventh-day Sabbath, that this is a privilege we get to still enjoy, and it's a moral commandment from God in his Ten Commandments. So I could just stop there, but can I do something just for fun for you? Because I stayed up all night once, back when I was you know, 20 years old, maybe 21 at that point. And that's just like, I got this book, and I wanted to, it's called From Sabbath to Sunday. It was about the history of where this changed and how this changed. And I was on a red eye. I'm like, I'm not even going to try to you know, get an ounce of sleep here, and a, a wink of sleep. So I, I'm just going to read this book cover to cover. And I just I stayed up all night, read this. And then I read another book later called The History of the Sabbath by J.N. Andrews. And there's this great documentary, by the way, if you're not interested in long academic tomes on the subject, you could go to Hal Holbrook, of all people, the great moderator or guest host of this documentary series called The Seventh Day. If you put that into YouTube, The Seventh Day with Hal Holbrook, you'll get a longer expanded version of some of the points that I'm going to truncate now down into just a couple of minutes. So put that in The Seventh Day series, Hal Holbrook. <clears throat> it's a five-part series. It's very good. And, oh, I should mention, speaking of YouTube videos, I don't know if the, the editors can do this, but could they even add these links into the description? That would be helpful. <laughs> good. Add the Hal Holbrook link, and then please also add a link to, it's called 40 Bible Facts About the Sabbath, and it's on the Belt of Truth Scott Ritzema page, YouTube page. 40 Bible Facts About the Sabbath, about the Sabbath. <clears throat> and basically, it's all of last night, and here what we just had the first half of tonight, all in one nine-minute video. So... I really expect people to pause and write down the text and look them up. But it's like everything has to be short on YouTube. So I'm like, let's see if we can do the whole law and the Sabbath teaching in one short video. It's fast talking, but you've already got the primer for it. So you'll be like, yup, 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 yup. But anyway, that's a good one to share if you're looking to introduce people to these things who don't necessarily have a long attention span for a 16 part you know, series of one hour messages. I hope we all do. It's important to study, but uh, anyway. 40 Bible Facts About the Sabbath at the Belt of Truth, Scott Ritzema YouTube page is another good one to put in the description. Now, um, one thing we do know is the Sabbath did not get changed to Sunday during the Bible times. How do we know that from last night? Remember, something was changed about the Gentiles coming into the church, and it caused a lot of division from the Judaizers within the church. And what was that thing that they changed? No more circumcision. Is no, no circumcision is required of Gentiles coming into the church. It's circumcision of the heart that counts. And then these, this circumcision group, this whole sect within Christianity emerged and caused a lot of trouble. And Paul was like, they are dogs. They are, they are Judaizers. And it was a problem. Now, what did the Jews consider of more importance, circumcision or the seventh-day Sabbath of every single week of the worship of, of God? If, they, if Paul or Peter or anybody would have been like, we're chucking the Sabbath, we're done with that, and it was never mentioned, you would have at least found controversy arising in the book of Acts. 
And then we were in this city where the Judaizers were causing trouble about continuing the Sabbath. And we, that would be everywhere in the New Testament, right? The silence on a controversy over the change in the Sabbath is conclusive testimony that it did not change during that first century period during which the scriptures were being written. So that we know. So we have to look to after that period. Well, I can tell you this. For about a hundred years after the resurrection of Christ with the apostles going out to the then known world, for about a hundred years, Christianity was spreading like wildfire. You had Thomas go to India. Paul, the Acts records his journeys throughout the, the, the Asia Minor. Philip witnesses to an Ethiopian eunuch who spreads the gospel down into Africa. And everywhere that the religion of Christianity spreads, naturally, Sabbath observance goes with it. Now, about in the second century, very early, earlier than what some people realize, in the second century, after all the apostles are dead, this idea of having assemblies and worshiping on Sundays begins in two places. One is Alexandria, where they have this mythical notion of the eighth day, and they spiritualized a lot of things and got into some weird philosophy, too much too much uh, study of the Greek philosophers there in Alexandria, where the famous burned library was located. But Rome, of course, is the heart of the empire, and the Caesars are still ruling here in the second century. And the Jews and the Caesars, the Jews and the Romans, rather, are having this, again, Jewish revolts in the second century under the emperor Hadrian. The Jewish emperor says, enough of these Jews, your religion is outlawed and they outlawed Judaism by outlawing their Sabbath observance because that's the most outward display of what it would have been at that time to be a Jew. Now, the Christians are caught in that net because they're like, no, 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 well, I, you're just a sect of Jews, right? No, 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 we're different. We, we follow Jesus the Messiah. We, have our, we are the way. We are the Christian church. That, that, that distinction was, was kind of lost on the Romans, right? You're on the Sabbath too. You're with them. Same, same religion. Christians are getting caught up in that persecution. What is the overwhelming temptation at this point then? Oh, no, no, the Sabbath is Jewish. And I can't say I would have done any better out of persecution. It's easy to look back and judge. But that was the direction of what some of these Christians in Rome, right under the nose of the Roman Imperial Army, did. And they began also, like Alexandria, notice having worship on Sunday, but they still didn't call Sunday the Sabbath because that's a ludicrous thing to say, biblically. Sabbath is a day of the week. I mean, just think about it in Spanish. It would be a nonsensical statement to say Domingo is the Sabado. Like, what? That's like me saying to you, Tuesday is Wednesday. You'd be like, are you okay, Scott? <laughs> right? it, so they didn't call Sunday the Sabbath. But then fast forward another couple hundred years to 321 AD. This is the first Roman imperial law that establishes Sunday sacredness as a law of the land is from a pagan Roman emperor called Constantine. He says on the venerable, by the way, he was pagan and then he supposedly had this conversion to Christianity and Christianity became a conquering force because he saw this vision that said in this sign, the sign of the cross, you will conquer. And so Christianity begins to be merged with the empire you get imperial Christianity. Instead of Christians being persecuted and pure in their faith, they're picking up the sword of power. Not, not they, but Constantine is, is acquiring that Christian movement for his ends. Whether it was policy or whether he was sincere, it doesn't matter. Because when he came out with this law, it was purely pagan. He didn't say a thing about the resurrection of Christ or anything. He says, on the venerable day of the sun. That's pagan terminology. They worship the sun on Sunday in Rome. He says, let the magistrates and the people residing in cities rest and let the shops be closed. Constantine, the pagan Roman emperor, makes a pagan edict. Everybody's going to worship the sun, Christians and pagans together, because the Christians are starting to recognize Sunday as something of value to them. And the pagans certainly have for centuries. It's the venerable day of the sun, after all, the sun god, the most important god at the time. And so that was the first one. Now, the church gets on board with its councils and authorities in Rome under the council of Laodicea. And they start pulling this whole card of the Seventh-day Sabbath is Jewish again. They said, Christians shall not, shall not Judaize and be idle on Saturday, but the Lord's Day they shall especially honor. They called Sunday the Lord's Day. Uh, that phrase is in the book of Revelation. 
that John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, but it doesn't identify that as the first day of the week. That is later a term applied to that phrase so that we then read that into the text in Revelation. It doesn't say first day. It says the Lord's day. Which day is God's actual day? The Sabbath, right? But they say Lord's Day here, applying it to the first day of the week. And they say, we shall, if possible, do no work on that day, the first day of the week. If, however, they are found Judaizing, they shall, Christians shall be cut out from Christ. So you will be excommunicated from the church if you are seventh-day Sabbath keeping and not observing the first day of the week. That's some strong medicine coming from the Roman church. There's no, there's no uh, single bishop of Rome over all the churches yet, that doesn't happen until 538, that he's totally supreme. But this is the embryonic Roman Catholic Church here, speaking through the Council of Laodicea. So <laughs> there's, I guess, why we all, so many of Christianity, uh, so much of Christianity keeps Sunday today. It's been almost 2,000 years, so it must be correct, because it's been going on for so long, right? Well, that reminds me of a story of a new bride. She comes home and she's very happy to cook her, uh, her, her husband a, a meal. And she gets out the, uh, the chopping block and gets out the hunk of meat there. And she's like, honey, I'm going to make you a nice roast. And she proceeds to, to cut off the end of that roast, discard it, and put the rest in the oven, in the roaster. And her husband's looking at that going, honey, isn't that a lot of you know, quality uh, portion of that meat there that you just threw away? Why did you throw it away? And she goes, well, I don't know. My mom just did that one, so I'm trying to do it you know, like my mom did and, and be a good housewife here. And he goes, but it doesn't make any sense. And Call your mom. Why do you do that? And she calls her mom. She's like, mom, why do we cut the end off of the roast? And she says, you know, sweetie, I don't even know. Uh, Grandma just did it that way. My mom did it that way. And they're like, let's get a three-way call going here because I want to get to the bottom of this. Grandma, why do we cut the end of the roast off before we put it in the, in the oven? And she goes, yeah, you're still doing that? I don't know why you guys do that, but my pan was too small. That's why I did it. <laughs> yeah. Now, of course, not all Christians got the memo in the 300s that this new thing was coming in. They, didn't, they weren't all under the nose of Rome. They weren't all taking the cues of the Council of Laodicea. They're out in the British Isles. They're down in Africa. They're out in India. They're out in the mountains. There's Christians all over the place, and not all of them get the memo right away. And this is why you can find in the 300s and 400s and as late as 1,000 years after Christ, you can find... Sabbath-keeping Christians who are like, what do you mean? It's always been the Sabbath. We have the Scripture. We have, the, we have God's Word. Sunday, where did that come from? You know what the African Christians called it when Rome finally consolidated its power and its influence and, and eliminated all of these Sabbath-keeping sects from the Roman system? The African Christian called it called Sunday White Man's Day because it was that Roman um, Roman Catholic system that came down. You can find Celtic Christians in the British Isles. You can find Armenian Christians, Indian Christians, African Christians, all keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Including, by the way, do you know the name Saint? Patrick. Now, he was a saint in the same sense you and I are saints. I, I don't get into the sainting of things like, like you do in the Vatican system, but Patrick was a real man, a godly man, and was a seventh-day Sabbath keeper. And also Columbo. This, these are people from the British Isles. So there was an actual Patrick, not the cartoon character that gives people an excuse to drink alcohol in March. I'm talking the real guy, the real genuine article. Here's another source from from the Roman system, Catholicism and Fundamentalism is the name of the book. Carl Keating is a leading Catholic apologist. He said, fundamentalists, that's anybody who believes in the Bible. That's, I know it sounds like a scary term. It's just, you believe in the Bible. Bible-believing Protestant Christians meet for worship on Sunday. Yet there is no evidence in the Bible that corporate worship was to be made on Sundays. Is he correct about that? He's correct. That's, that's true, right? He says that, here's Jewish again, the Jewish Sabbath or day of rest, <clears throat> was, of course, Saturday. It was the Catholic Church that decided Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. The Catholic Church decided it. And you've seen the history now. Now listen to what Roman Catholic Cardinal Gibbons wrote in the book Faith of Our Fathers. 
You may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday. So, we are ending with this question. God's word and God's truth, or human tradition, human opinion? And I know human tradition can be hard. It can mean childhood, friendships, culture, family, a lot of things that hit close to the heart. And so I don't mean to treat that lightly. But at the end of the day, I have to ask myself, am I going with the word of God or am I going with authority or conformity? And if I have to be a little different, still loving toward everybody around me, then I have to do that. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Amen. If you're wondering, by the way, about grandmas who've, who've passed away and they were faithful Christians and they loved their Jesus and they, they, they were in the word and they went to church faithfully every Sunday, and you're wondering, you know, this is in the Ten Commandments. It's kind of a big deal. Is she lost? Are they lost? I have some encouraging words from you, for you from the book of Acts. Paul, in chapter 17, is speaking to Athenian Greek philosophers about their different altars and gods that they worship. And he points at one that simply says, to an unknown god. And he says to them, the god that you worship as unknown, I'm going to tell you about, the creator god. And basically, he gave them the benefit of the doubt that they were ignorantly worshiping the Creator God with that altar. And it, but he uses this phrase, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. Is that encouraging to you? That if somebody in all sincerity was doing their best to love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and they didn't have all the knowledge, but they had all the love, Knowledge can puff up, but love builds up. And I want real knowledge. You know what real knowledge is? It's to know Jesus, to have a relationship with him. And this is eternal life, Jesus said, to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And so do you know him as your personal savior and friend? That's the most important thing. And if grandma had that, then when this light came across her path, she would have followed it with joy and will. Because she's going to come out of the grave in the right resurrection, and she's going to be worshiping from one Sabbath to another, as it says in Isaiah 66. Do you think she's going to get up there and be like, no, this isn't right. I can't do it on that day. I got, I got to do it on my day. When she's in the presence of her Jesus, who she loved all along, not a chance. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart from 1 Samuel. Is that true? God knows the heart of every sincere, sincere follower of him. And never would we want to point at people and say, well, that person must be lost. Judge not, lest ye be judged, the Bible says. I know you wouldn't do that, but I want everybody to hear that and myself to hear it again. The rest of the verse is important too. We don't want to leave people in ignorance. We want to call them to the biblical truth of Jesus Christ, full and free that we don't retain ignorance, that we repent of our wayward ways. If I was off on the wrong path, I'm like, whoa, I was just doing that because that's what I was taught to do. And now I see in God's word a, 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 a better way, a more truthful way, and the biblically authoritative way from God. I say, enough of that. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the patience of the saints to simply say, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it, and my faith in Christ needs to come first, last, best, and everything in my life, period, no questions asked. There was a time in Jesus' early ministry when he was at a wedding feast, and Mary said to the servants about the water pots and that whole scene, she says to the servants of that feast, whatever he says to you, do it. That's good advice for us, isn't it? Whatever he says to us, do it without flinching. Yes, I love you, so I will obey. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So from sunset to sunset on your holy Sabbath, I will enjoy that sacred time. And that requires faith. I can't see the sacredness of the time. I look around and everybody's living like it's any old day. But to God, it's not any old day. He wants your attention. He wants your worship. He wants your focus. He wants your friendship. I will remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And blessed is the man who delights in the law of God. 
who calls the Sabbath a delight. If you want the references, that's Psalm 1, verse 2, delighting in the law of God. Isaiah 58, 13, call the Sabbath a delight. Who wants to step into that peace tonight? Who wants to say yes to that invitation, saying, I commit to the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, to remember it, to work six days, and to rest that seventh day. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that we can know this truth that is so liberating, so empowering, so beautiful, that draws us closer to you and gives us the confidence to know we are not deceived. We are receiving of your spirit and the word of truth. May we now have the, the courage to live it and to share it, to share it in whatever way you have prompted us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks.